So here there is a view of the JWST focal plane, which you can see various instruments that uh, there will be a disposal. Today, we are going to focus on two of them uh, used in imaging mode that are near cam, the one that you see here in the center and the one on the top right that is Miri. So during this presentation, uh, Matteo and I will give you a brief overview of the two instruments, a few things to remember when you plan your observation with them, and about the pipeline that receives these uh, data. And then we will uh, describe a few things about what you're going to discuss today during the webinar that are specifically aperture photometry with MIRI data and the PSF photometry with uh, the near camera. So let's start with the overview of the instrument. The first one is uh, MIRI, that is the acronym for mid infrared instrument. It is an instrument that offers um, uh, classical imaging, coronographic imaging, low and medium resolution spectroscopy that cover wavelengths from 4.9 to 28.8 microns. So we are in the mid infrared range of the spectrum. And as you can understand that these wavelengths, you can perform a variety of investigation that goes from uh, the identification and, and analysis of exoplanets to the identification and characterization of high radiation galaxies. Here on this slide, you see on the left, there is a table in which there are all the observing modes that are offered with MIRI together with a few specs. And on the right, you see an overview of the uh, JWST focal plane uh, foc uh, zooming in around MIRI, which you can see uh, how the, the detector is actually fractioned in different areas according to the observing mode that, that uh, you're going to use uh, do with your observation. The only one that is slightly different is the one that you see here, that, that uh, small squares that you see on the top right of this plot that are the MRS um, instrument and uh, that has two dedicated detectors. So as we said at the beginning, today we are going to focus on imaging with MIRI. So uh, MIRI offer imaging from 5.6 to 25.5 micron with a pixel scale of 0.11 or second per pixel. Uh, the PSF is going to be Nyquist sample at about 7 micron, and it's going to be this way under sample at shorter wavelength and uh, over sample at uh, longer wavelength. When we talk about the MIRI imager, we refer to the area that is shown in gray on the, on the right, on the bottom right plot. But as I will show you today, uh, when you obtain data with the MIRI imager, uh, you can also um, use the area that is usually dedicated to the layout coronography. And I will explain you during these, uh, the, our notebook uh, the reasons why it is possible. And here we have, <coughs> sorry, we have a similar um, slide for our concern near cam, and as you can guess from the name, is a near infrared camera, so shorter wavelength than MIRI. And we have five, dif sorry, four different modes. That is basically imaging, uh, coronographic imaging, wide field uh, sleep spectroscopy, and also a monitoring mode uh, with time series uh, can be also can be imaging or spectroscopic with uh, with time series. Um, as Matthias said, in this particular uh, webinar, we will concentrate on the imaging. So uh, this is the mode on top. Uh, our wavelength coverage is between 0.6 and 2.3, and 2.4 and 5.0. Uh, why too? Because uh, as you probably already know, NIRCAM, uh, uh, each model of NIRCAM, as you can see on the right, NIRCAM has two adjacent models that uh, observe uh, uh, simultaneously, and each model has a dichroic uh, that allows to observe simultaneously at short uh, and long wavelength, and uh, as I said, uh, 0.6 and 2.3 uh, is the range for the short wavelength, and 2.4 and 5.0 is for the long wavelength, with the different pixel scale that are reported in the uh, fourth column. Uh, NIRCAM is uh, an equity sample that uh, two or two micron and four microns. So for the uh, filters bluer than than this uh, limit uh, is quite undersampled. And um, as I said on the right, you can see which is the field of view. And for the long wavelength, uh, we have one detector, uh, whereas for the short wavelength, uh, we have four. So uh, when you uh, observe with NIRCAM imaging uh, using both models, we have uh, uh, ten images. Uh, at the bottom, uh, there are a couple of um, plots that show the NIRCAM filters and the sensitivity for all the information, general information on the instrument and in particular imaging. There are links at the bottom of the page uh, where you can uh, uh, see all these particular details about the instrument and also the other modes if you're interested, of course. Uh, next slide. 
And as Matthias said at the beginning, of course, before uh, analyzing your data, you have to be sure that uh, uh, you have the best data quality uh, possible. And so uh, you have to be um, very careful when you plan your observation, but with Mirka, Mirkam and Miri. Uh, this is particularly important since uh, uh, there are a lot of things that you have to take into account. And here we just uh, reported a couple of uh, uh, bullets so that you have to um, be careful about it in mind when you, when you prepare your observation. And there are the links uh, if you want to add more information and uh, general information about uh, the recommended strategies for both instruments when you're doing imaging. In particular, one of the things that you have to take into account uh, is, of course, uh, the readout pattern that you're using because uh, both instruments uh, use a multi acum technique. And there are links here to if you want to know what this means and uh, what kind of readout patterns are available. Of course, uh, in particular, when you're dealing with uh, imaging, it's important to select the appropriate detail pattern. And there are different for NIRCAM and MIRI. Uh, for example, for NIRCAM, if you want to uh, resample the PSF, uh, we have subpixel data pattern. But as I showed you before, since we have uh, two models that can observe simultaneously, there are patterns uh, also to cover the gaps between the model and also between the chip of the short wave and detector. Uh, another thing, of course, is uh, uh, be careful when you're observing with bot models in NIRCAM because uh, uh, the, if you insert a target in the APT, uh, the target will be placed uh, in the middle of the two models. So if it's the object that you would like uh, to observe, you have to put an offset. Otherwise, it's just uh, uh, not observed. And uh, of course, it is really important, uh, in particular for MIRI, since it's uh, um, uh, Mid infrared is the background, so there are a lot of tools to understand if uh, your observation are background limited and also how uh, the different component impact uh, your observation. Uh, last thing that is not reported here, but I would like to mention is also, of course, the data volume and data access, because as I told you before with NIRCAM, uh, we are observing uh, with two models, meaning uh, uh, 10 images each time. And so it's uh, a lot of data that have to be uh, down leaked from the telescope. So it is important to uh, mitigate the data volume uh, when you do NIRCAM observation. Once you, you have obtained your data and hopefully following the recommendation that Matteo just uh, uh, showed to you, uh, your data will hit the mass archive and the next thing that is going to go through is the JWST pipeline. So the JWST pipeline has been discussed in previous J webinars, so I'm not going to give you a detailed description of all the, the entire pipeline. I just want to remind you that there are three main stages in the pipeline. The first one, stage one, is the one that applies detector level correction to the, to the data and produce a count rate images per exposure. The stage two of the pipeline that applies correction, physical corrections and calibration to the individual exposures and produces fully calibrated, unrectified exposures. And then there is the stage three pipeline that combines the uh, fully calibrated data from multiple exposures and create a variety of uh, outputs. As you can see um, uh, from uh, uh, this chart here on the left, after stage one of the pipeline, uh, the uh, pipeline start to branches according to the observing mode that was actually observing mode that was actually uh, used in your observations. Uh, when you obtain your data with the imaging, um, you are going through this branch of the pipelines, pipeline. So detector one, image two, and image three. And if you're interested in how to use these three steps, uh, three stages of the pipeline, and how to run it, uh, look at the material of the webinar number three, in which there is a, a, an exhaustive discussion of this. Today, we are going to uh, work, uh, as we said, on upper two MPSF photometry with mirror near-term images, and we are going to use the images that have been output from by the stage two image of the pipeline. So we are not going through the entire uh, pipeline of JWST, but they're going to stop after the second stage. There are many reasons why we choose to do so. So um, the first one is just that a simple one. We want to provide a new perspective on how to use the JWST data um, according to your scientific uh, needs, to the tool that you're going to use. You might want to start from, for example, the stage two images and not go through the entire uh, stage three um, uh, pipeline. Um, then uh, another reason is that 
if uh, your data was taken with dithering, so you have multiple exposure of the same of your target observing in different position of your um, of your of, of the detector. Uh, if you create astrophotometric catalogs of these with uh, these stage two images, uh, you can have an assessment, a direct of assessment of the systematics uh, that affect your data, and as well as you can also compute a statistical error. For example, you compute a mean and the um, RMS of a specific quantity, and so you can understand if one of the your measurement is an outlier with respect to the others, and so on. Um, the third point that we listed here is specific for the PSF fitting, and uh, so the stage two images preserve some pieces of information that are essential when you want to do high precision astronomy, and so when you want to do PSF fitting. So if you are interested in doing uh, PSF photometry or uh, PSF astronomy as well, uh, you you might want to start from the node sample data of, uh, that are provided by the stage two image. And then there are many other reasons. And here, Matena, we thought about one that is the last one uh, listed here, that is uh, for viability study. Uh, Matena works on stellar populations and in particular on globular clusters. And when you combine multiple images uh, at, the, for example, obtained at the stage two um, level, you can, uh, as I said before, you can compute a statistical errors, so for example, on the magnitude. And so, if you um, if you focus on variable stars that are present in old stellar populations, so are alive stars, you might be, you might see that their statistical error on the magnitude is larger than all the other stars at the same magnitude level. And so this give you, this give you an hint that there's something uh, different from the other stars. So you can identify variable stars. And if your data was taken also with a specific uh, um, uh, phasing with, uh, along these. Uh, uh, RLI light curve, you might also be able to construct a, a very uh, easy, uh, in a very easy way, a, a light curve for your target. In the last three slides, we are, are going to present well, the main topics of today. So the first one is going to be aperture photometry with the mirror data, as I said before. So aperture photometry is very basic. And uh, it just it is just interested in the total flux that you measure uh, within a, a finite aperture. So you select your target, uh, you place an aperture there, you measure all the flux that is within it, and that that's it. So it's not it's not that complicated. What it takes more time to fine tune are for is for example the aperture sizes and that you might want to choose and spend time on. Uh, that my, this it depends on the target that you are studying, so how bright it is, and on the scene that you are looking at. And uh, the um, to measure to when you do aperture photometry, what you are doing is just measuring the flux within the aperture. So you also have to take into account that you have find another some ways with the specific algorithm that you want to use to pinpoint your target on your image. And of course, uh, this is, as I said, is very basic. So it has also very uh, several limitations. The first one, the most obvious one, is crowded environment. If you have two close by sources and you place an aperture that is, that uh, contains both of them, you're going to measure the total flux of the two. So again, uh, there are um, you might want to use a different solution to analyze your data. Uh, and this, this is this is the different solution that Mattia was mentioning, and this the idea of doing PSF fitting photometry. So as they were say, you're just trying to use a model to fit uh, uh, the profile and the flux of your stars. Uh, there are many ways to do it, and they can be uh, from the basic one to the more complex. Uh, and also the function that they are using could be a simple one, like for example, an analytic uh, PSF uh, that could be a, a more fat or Gaussian function. And if you're familiar for, uh, with the EOFOD, this is what the, that program does, or it could be a synthetic PSF or an empirical PSF. So a PSF that is measured on the image uh, and is a combination of the instrumental one and the pixel response function. Of course, there are many things you want to take into account when you do PSF photometry. And for example, one is using a single PSF or a grid of PSF because you can have a special variation in the field. And what does it mean? This is that basically uh, you have variation in the optical distortion and also variation in the thickness of the detector. So uh, your PSF uh, vary uh, depending on when you are on the detector. Uh, from a semantic point of view, it's pretty sort of easy to do PSF photometry if you look at this uh, 
scheme that I reported here because you start from an image, you have your model that, as we said, could be an analytic, synthetic, empirical, and then uh, you apply the model to the image and uh, you uh, obtain a CMD as seen here on the right plot. Uh, next slide. And the final one, of course, uh, the usual question is uh, what I should do. I mean, should they do aperture or PSF photometry? And that is uh, really a $1 million question and it really depends on your science. Uh, it really depends on uh, what you're looking for. It depends uh, on many things. For example, one is the level of the crowding. Uh, usually, if you have a very sparse field, uh, aperture photometry is perfectly fine. Uh, you're able to measure uh, the flux of the stars and the flux of the stars. And also, uh, if your uh, uh, centroid position is not super accurate, it really doesn't matter because, as Matthias said, you're just measuring everything that is inside uh, a, a circular uh, radius. Of course, when the crowded increase, uh, you're going to encounter some problem. Here, for example, we have on the left an image uh, of um, a portion uh, not even that much uh, crowded of uh, globular clusters. And you can see there are uh, some objects that you can clearly see are stars, circular uh, shaped, uh, while the one uh, with the green uh, circle, uh, as Matthias is pointing right now, has a different shape. So. If you look at the right and you look at the profile, you can clearly see that the, those are two stars very close to each other. So what happens when you do aperture photometry? Uh, basically, you are finding both of them. You're probably able to find uh, uh, both centers. But then when you draw a circle and try to measure the flux, uh, how can you divide uh, between uh, the two? How can you assign the right component to the two uh, different stellar uh, um, uh, different stars? So that's why uh, in this particular case, PSF photometry is definitely better. Other reason is why, of course, uh, depending on the magnitude regime, uh, if you are bright uh, or faint, uh, uh, as Mattia mentioned before when he was talking about aperture, uh, when you do PSF, uh, it provides uh, astrometry for free. And the last point, of course, is always that aperture photometry, as we said, I mean, it's pretty easy because it's just uh, measuring something inside the region while PSF modeling uh, uh, is much more complex and it really depends on uh, how many images you have, the undersampling of your PSF uh, and uh, all these uh, particular uh, different uh, um, components of your analysis.